What did Tammy Terrell, Florence Ballard, and Olympia Silvers from the Silvers all have in common? And why is it important for us to talk about it? Tammy Terrell was one of the most popular singers of Motown's early hit factory in the 1960s, particularly with her duet partner and close friend, Marvin Gaye. Tammy Terrell was born Thomasina Winifred Montgomery in Philadelphia to Jenny and Thomas Montgomery. Jenny was an actress and Thomas was a barber shop owner and local politician. According to her sister, their mother was mentally ill. Tammy was the older of the two siblings. Tammy's career began as a teenager recording for Scepter Wand Records before she spent two years as a member of James Brown's live show. She also recorded briefly for Checker Records before signing with Motown in 1965. Alongside Marvin Gaye, Terrell scored several big hits, including Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, and You're All I Need to Get By. In an episode of the music documentary series, Unsung, it was revealed that Terrell suffered from health, mental, and physical trauma after being raped at the age of 11 by three teenage boys when she was on her way home from school. Around this time, Tammy began to experience heavy migraine headaches. While it was not thought to be of significance at the time, family members would subsequently state that those migraine headaches might have been related to her later diagnosis of brain cancer. In 1962, 17 year old Tammy Terrell became involved in an abusive relationship with the singer James Brown, who was 12 years older than she. One night in 1963, Tammy left Brown after he assaulted her for not watching his entire performance. Bobby Bennett, a former member of the Famous Flames, witnessed the incident saying, James beat Tammy Terrell terrible. She was bleeding, shedding blood. Tammy left him because she didn't want her butt whipped. And let me pause and say this right here. Why didn't Bobby or the rest of the boys stop James Brown from beating on Tammy? Like, bruh, none of y'all could have came in and been like, hey, dude, stop hitting her. I just don't understand how they could not keep him off of her. She was 16, 17 years old. With all of those men in that band, in that group, the people that saw her being abused, you mean to tell me not one of them encouraged James Brown to stop beating on Tammy Terrell? Tammy goes home, stays home with her family for a couple of years. She attends college and goes to medical school. And then she's, she performs at a nightclub one night. Barry Gordy sees her. She is then signed to Motown Records. Shortly thereafter, in 1966, Terrell then started a romance with The Temptations' lead singer, David Ruffin. That year, Terrell accepted Ruffin's proposal for marriage. After Terrell announced their engagement on stage, she discovered that he was already married. Ruffin had a wife, three children, and another girlfriend in Detroit, and five chihuahuas. Ruffin was not playing. Ruffin was not about to marry Tammy Terrell because he was already married. Ruffin, David Ruffin was doing the most. A lot of the men at Motown were doing the most at this time. And the females were doing the most. Let's be real about it. But anyways, at this time, Dave, David Ruffin's drug addiction led to several violent arguments. In 1967, Tammy ended their relationship after David Ruffin hit her in the head with his motorcycle helmet. By this time in her career, Tammy Terrell had become a star. She continued to suffer from migraines and headaches she had since childhood. On October 14, 1967, while performing Your Precious Love with Marvin Gaye at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, she collapsed in Marvin Gaye's arms on stage. Doctors soon diagnosed a malignant tumor on the right side of her brain. She underwent surgery, brain surgery that is, in early 1968. After recovering from her first surgery, she continued recording and performing live. Despite her optimism, her tumors worsened and, need, and she needed more surgery. By 1969, Tammy Terrell had retired from live performances on orders by doctors and was too ill to record new music. 
Also in 1969, Tammy Terrell made her final public appearance at the Apollo Theater where Marvin Gaye was performing. When Marvin spotted Tammy, he rushed to her side and the duo began singing, You're All I Need to Get By. They received a standing ovation. Due to complications of her brain cancer, by early 1970, Tammy Terrell was confined to a wheelchair. By this point, she had suffered from blindness, hair loss, and weighed only 93 pounds. After her eighth and final operation on January 21, 1970, Tammy went into a coma. She died March 16, a month before her 25th birthday. Her funeral was held at the James Methodist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. At the funeral, Marvin Gaye delivered a final eulogy while You're All I Need to Get By was playing. According to Tammy's fiance, Dr. Ernest Ernie Garrett, her mother angrily banned everyone at Motown from her funeral except for Marvin Gaye, whom she felt was Tammy's closest friend. And now for the T. Lee Vision Twist. What did Tammy Terrell Florence Ballard, Olympia Ann Silvers, all have in common? Well, you'd be surprised. There were several things they had in common. For instance, all were the oldest siblings, girls in their family. All were singers, talented, and very beautiful. All three of them were sexually assaulted, raped, and violated horrifically. Two out of the three Tammy and Olympia were gang raped. Two out of the three, Florence and Olympia, were forced to have sex by knife point. All three of the women had their virginity stolen, snatched, taken away violently by the criminal acts perpetrated upon them. All of them were in abusive relationships. Two out of the three, Tammy and Florence's life ended early. Two out of the three were signed to a Motown contract, Tammy and Florence. Now a little bit about Olympia Ann Silvers. Olympia Ann Silvers was the eldest child to the, for all the Silvers. There were 10 of them. Olympia was once a stunning young woman during the group's early years, had been kidnapped, viciously attacked, stabbed, and forced to escape out of a moving vehicle where she managed to run to safety. Unfortunately, she would never be the same after the event and ended up suffering from severe mental illness, schizophrenia. She lived on the streets of LA and was beaten and attacked several more times while dealing with her mental problems. Now let's take an even deeper dive. I want you to consider these things. One, all of these ladies had similar kind of experiences, similar types of attacks. How is it that one is from Philly, one from Detroit, and one is from Los Angeles, and but yet their lives sort of mirror each other? Now, let me take it a little bit deeper. Because these beautiful women's sexual imprint, their sexual imprint was destroyed when they were violated. And because they received no therapy, healing emotionally at the time, they subsequently became involved with men who repeated patterns of abuse from the original trauma of being violated. It was ingrained in their broken souls to be treated in this way. Hence the downward spiral and the repeated cycles. My question to you is, who do you think was the culprit? Why are there similarities in these women's lives and, and they weren't even in the same region when each of their attacks happened? Why does this reeks of evil from the damnable corridors of hell? I invite you to consider maybe these sought off attacks were birthed from the pit of hell. I can hear you say tea leaf vision. There you go again. You are crazy, girl. You always talking about the devil, blaming the devil. Nah, I ain't crazy. Let's dive a little deep. I definitely believe that there was a satanic, demonic assignment assigned to these women's lives 
because of their bloodline. Because of their bloodline. There were demons that were stalking them. Yes, the devil was stalking them. Stalking their bloodline. Satan hunts for the precious soul. Iniquity and stalking demons. Demons who track specific bloodlines and send hordes of demons out to monitor, watch, oppress, unsuspecting people. They do this through legal access and right due to our ancestors' iniquities and sins and transgressions passed down through the bloodlines for many generations. And if no one stands in the gap, no one repents, no one acts God for the washing and the forgiveness of the bloodline and the washing the forgiveness for the ancestors for the wickedness they have done, that iniquity falls on the third and fourth and fifth generation. But God is so faithful. He is so faithful. Because even though these demons may know your proclivity, they know your weaknesses, they know all of the bad that's in you because they were the ones inflicting horrific traumas and pains on your bloodlines from way back. But God, but Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins, rose on the third day with all power in his hands, the son of the living God, that blood that Jesus Christ shed was for all of us was for our entire bloodlines all the way back to Adam and Eve. And it's that blood, that blood that washes, heals, forgives, that steps in, changes, blocks, binds up, and casts out every wickedness, every lie, and changes the wickedness, the iniquities, and the things inside of us that keep us bound and keep us going the wrong, opposite way. There was somebody always in the family praying. There was somebody that God will set the solitary in the family for them to stand up, to pray, to fast, to stand in the gap, to plead the blood of Jesus, and to pray for all of the loved ones. Those of you who are listening right now, I challenge you, I encourage you, I implore you to begin to believe that God has called you to be the one to change the dynamics in your family. Now, everything that happened to Tammy Terrell, Florence Ballard, and everything that happened to Olympia Ann Silvers, it was not of God. It was demonic. And I wish to God there was somebody that had stood in the gap and knew how to pray and fast and intercede on behalf of these women. Because a lot of these things didn't have to happen to them the way that they did. They needed somebody to come and close the door to stand in the gap to pray and intercede and break off witchcraft, break off whoredoms, break off the Jezebel spirit, break off us stalking demons, break off domestic violence, break off sexual demons, break off abuse. 